Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to day three of Inclusion Week. Before we begin our formal um, programming, I'm going to turn to my colleague, Darcy Bilal, to start with our land acknowledgement and to begin our session today in a good way. Darcy? Thank you so much, Marion. This is Darcy Belisle from the Center for the Human uh, for Human Rights Equity and Inclusion speaking. As this meeting is virtual and we're not all gathered in the same space, I want to recognize that this acknowledgement may not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask if that's the case, that you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you're on, as well as the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Thank you so much uh, for your attention on that acknowledgement. I'd like to take a brief moment to reflect upon the land acknowledgement within the context of the session and a phrase that is part of the description for today's keynote um, goes like this. Quote, allies to solidarity are usually vague about what solidarity entails and abstracted from the realities of doing social justice work, end quote. So in reflection upon this acknowledgement in relation to that quotation, um, I just want to say that while the vagueness that can accompany calls to solidarity is certainly a challenge, it's important for us to understand that the land, land acknowledgement that I just provided is not vague. It's intentional and it's a direct call to action. Now, there are many calls to action that can be read from the land acknowledgement, but critically, the recognition of treaty is a call to solidarity in the sense that it reminds us that we're all impacted by and hold responsibilities under the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. And when I say I mean we, I'm sorry, and when I say we, I mean we, we, Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples, we are all treaty peoples. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass it back to Marianne. Thank you so much, Darcy, for, um, for providing us with the land acknowledgement and, um, and in particular, the um, the, the opportunity to reflect on that land acknowledgement and as it relates to our, our conversations today about solidarity, justice, and sustainability at, at York. Uh, land acknowledgements are an important guide that signals a direction forward for all of us. And on that note now, I will turn to um, the Vice President, Equity, People, and Cult Culture, Dr. Sheila Cote Meek to introduce our speaker and the events for today. Um, I would also just note and, and want to make sure I pay special attention to um, acknowledging that this um, event today is part of the, it's in um, partnership with the speaker series um, um, put forward under the um, President's Advisory Council on Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. Over to you, Sheila. This is Sheila Kotinik, uh, Vice President, Equity, People, and Culture speaking. Uh, thank you, Marion, and thank you, Darcy. Kwe uh, Kwe, Bojo, Bonjour, and warm greetings. So welcome to Inclusion Week uh, 2022 and the continuance uh, of our speaker series. 
I'm really uh, delighted that you're all able to join us here today for Inclusion Days 2022 and for today's keynote. There are a number of activities throughout the week that have ha happened. Uh, we started on Monday with a workshop on orientating yourself to allyship and a fireside chat yesterday with invited guests exploring the question about who gets to rest. Today's keynote will be followed by tomorrow by a second workshop around deepening the conversation around allyship, as well as a panel discussion with activists and scholars on solidarity and liberation, which we hope you'll be able to attend. I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank the Center for Human Rights, Equity and Inclusion for organizing uh, this week's events and bringing us all together to have these important discussions around creating more equitable and caring futures. I also want to acknowledge that there are a number of institutional initiatives that surround Inclusion Days that are intended to advance equity and inclusion at the university. I want to touch on a few of them. The Addressing Anti-Black Racism, a framework on Black inclusion released in 2021, and the Action Plan on Black Inclusion, a living document for action, 2021. We also recently established the Advisory Council on Black Inclusion, which had its inaugural meeting uh, this past February 17th of 2022. Uh, we also have in place an Indigenous framework for, for the university, a guide to action that was released in 2017 and is consistently being implemented. We also have the President's Advisory Council on Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, which has been working on the development of a pan-university EDI strategy. I want to emphasize that there will be opportunities for the York community to comment on the draft strategy starting in mid-March and running through to the month, running through the month of April. So stay tuned for the, those invitations. All of these uh, initiatives, as well as others, are undertaken in the context of the ongoing work of all levels of the institution, including faculties, divisions, units, um, and they form the foundation for longer term systemic change. So shifting back to today's keynote, I'm very excited to be introducing a topic today that is important to my own work as the VP of Equity, People and Culture, and that is solidarity. As faculty, instructors, staff and students at one of the most diverse institutions in this country, we comprise broad, diverse and intersecting communities at York University. As we intentionally work towards equitable, just and caring futures for all, we must consider the meaning and applications of solidarity. So I'm very pleased that Dr. Ruben Gastabeni Fernandez has joined us today to help us explore the dimensions of solidarity. Dr. Gastam, sorry, Gastam Bede Fernandez's research and scholarship are concerned with questions of, symbol of symbolic boundaries and the dynamics of cultural production and processes of identification in educational contexts. He draws on cultural studies, decolonial, postcolonial, and feminist theory, as well as critical sociology to inform his understanding of curriculum and pedagogy as encounters with difference. He is the director of the Youth Research Lab at the Center for Urban Schooling of the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where he oversees and supports youth-oriented and community-based research projects with a focus on school-based youth participatory action research. At OISE, he is a professor of curriculum and pedagogy and editor-in-chief of the International Journal Curriculum Inquiry. His theoretical work focuses on the relationship between creativity, decolonization, and solidarity. And he has published widely on the topics of the arts in education, the sociology of elites, and pedagogies of solidarity. 
I would now like to invite Dr. Gaston Bidet Fernandez to guide us in this important discussion on the call to solidarity. Thank you, merci and miigwech. Hopefully everybody can see that. Thanks again for uh, inviting me to be part of this conversation and for sharing some of my thinking about solidarity, what it means, uh, what it, maybe what it doesn't mean uh, and what it might require of us. I am going to start um, by sharing an image, a picture telling a story about my mother. The child reaches forward with his toes, extending to touch the world from the comfort of his mother's lap. She smiles, wide brown eyes into the camera, left hand resting on her left knee while the index finger of her right hand clinches to the child's overalls near his belly, holding him in place. He smiles, right hand resting on her right wrist while the index finger of his left hand points forward. He feels the warmth of his mother's chin resting on his nearly bald head nested in the safety of her cross legs. The blades of grass reach up like threads bracing them both to the land. A scribble behind the photo, likely in my abuela's handwriting, marks the date. Ocho de noviembre de 1972. 49 and a half years as I speak virtually to all of you. This picture of my mother and I has been sitting on my dresser since 1989. The year I packed my trunk and moved away from home and away from my mother, my family, and my land, Boriken, also known as Puerto Rico. For three decades, the child and the mother have both stared at me. They reach for me. Her finger held him in place then, while his finger points point towards me and towards you now, away from that place to this place, from that moment to this moment, from that self to this self. Now you hear my words, you see the image. We are now connected in the distance of place and time away from each other, yet with each other through the image and through these words, we are making each other. My mother tells me that she was not trying to hook me in place, that she was trying to tickle me so that I would smile for the camera. But I see a hook. I see my mother keeping me in place. I tell my mother, that it's all the same. Making the child smile is a hook. The finger hooks a smile and pins the child in place. The smiling child and the story of the image now hook you. I hook you with my story and you pin me in this place. We are now together. We form a solid. We are in debt to each other for this moment. The image, the hook, the lap, the smile provides a glimpse into our path toward affectional solidarities, which according to feminist political philosopher Jody Dean, grows out of intimate relationships of love and friendship. I don't mean to suggest that there is solidarity between the parent and the child in this image, since the child cannot reciprocate the ability or perhaps even the desire to care for the parent, to hold and protect the parent from harm. In fact, as I hope to suggest today, our evolving capacity to reciprocate solidarity with our parents and indeed with anyone else hinges on our ability to recognize them, not just as separate from, each, from ourselves, but as ungraspable and beyond our capacity to know and to understand. Understanding my mother meant understanding how the wounds of her childhood animated her lifelong commitments, her revolt against patriarchy and her pursuit of women's rights, equity and social justice, and the colonial legacies of US imperialism in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. These commitments were the lap 
on which my infant body sat and from which my own commitments bloomed, but also in complex ways, the source of the wounds that would rupture the hooks between my mother and me. In my photograph, the mother's body is a womb that contains the infant body, even as the child extends his toes as if to take a step. Eventually, the child would also try to contain the mother, asking at the age of 11, can men be feminists? Asking my mother whether men could be feminists was not so much a political question as it was an expression of my desire to remain close to my mother, to pin my mother in place. Asking her whether men could be feminist was another way of asking if she loved me. The question sought to stabilize the otherwise unwieldy feeling of being loved. How can I be sure that you will always love me? At 11, my mother turned me down and broke my heart. Her finger let go and the child stumbled, disoriented. Bueno, she said, extending the E as she always does when the answer is complicated. Men could not be feminists, she explained, but men could be allies of feminism. They can stand by women and support the struggle from their sidelines. As if putting me in the friend zone of maternal love, she tried to reassure me that men could be solidarios with women. I don't recall her exact word and neither does she, but I am certain that she used the adverbial form and so is she. I am certain because this is the way my mother always invokes the term solidarity. Tenemos que ser solidarios, she would say to me, declaring when talking about the struggles of others near and far. This adverbial form matters because at least the way I learned it from my mother, solidarity is not a noun, but a way of being in the world that requires a modification of one's own behavior. Solidarity involves actions directed towards another, but which transform the self. It is, it is an orientation towards transformative action. It must have been terrifying for that 11 year old boy to ask his feminist mother if men could be feminists. Even in his incipient understanding of the very idea of feminism, he must have known that it implicated him, if not as a boy, as a future man. He must have perceived that his mother felt something about men and about the way men behave toward women. How could an 11 year old boy be sure that his mother's criticisms of patriarchal orders and gender inequality would not also represent the end of her love for him? He could perhaps be a feminist. The threat of the loss of the loved object is indeed a terrifying moment for the child, especially when that threat, when the potential that his mother will not love him is moored onto his potentiality of his own manhood. I have come to understand the ungraspability of both feminism as a cisgendered man and of my mother as her son. I can't hook my index finger onto her belly to keep her in place the way she did with my infant body. I can't tickle her into a smile, although I know that I make her smile often. It is precisely the desire to grasp the other, to hook the other in place that provokes the call to solidarity. Yet today I want to suggest that it is precisely the ungraspability of the other and the space created between the grasping and the failure to grasp that creates a space for a different kind of solidarity. While often an expression of the desire to hook the other in place, I want to suggest that solidarity is in fact a failure to grasp. Solidarity cannot seek to fix the other in place but to create the conditions for subjects to be otherwise, for that which is ungraspable to flourish. The moment we no longer grab or hook onto the other is precisely the moment we see them and are finally capable of enacting creative solidarity as a practice of freedom. 
My adult pursuit of the question of solidarity is a mirror to my 11 year old's question, can men be feminists? Uh, no, I am not asking you or anyone else to love me, although I do hope that my words offer you doorways into what is possible beyond this present. As I live my life today, I am seen and I see myself as a cisgendered, male-identified and heteromanly performing most of the time. No one wonders if I am what current society classifies as a man, and I don't question it either, though how I live that classification remains unhooked. Still, I enjoy the many positional privileges granted to men in a patriarchal social order. And therefore, to write about solidarity is in some ways akin to asking the question, can men be feminists? Because I ask the question from a position of relative privilege. Can I, given all the privileges of being identified and identifying as a man and enacting a normative manhood, be solidarious with those who ex whose experiences of gender and sexuality, how they feel and see themselves as gendered and sexual beings, do not grant them positional privileges in a patriarchal social order. And by extension, can I, as a racially ambiguous, albeit white passing, guest working on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently of the Mississauga of the Credit River. With all the material and symbolic privileges of being a university professor and the benefits of being a citizen of the very settler colonial nation that sponsors my being in this place, be solidarious with indigenous and anti-racist struggles, not just here, but across Turtle Island and the Abbey Ayala. This is an image of the Abbey Ayala. Thus, the question about men and feminism points to an expansive reframing as a question about solidarity, not whether men can be feminists, but whether, but whether I can be solidarious with you. Or more to the point I want to make today, can we solidarize ourselves with each other? This shift in syntax is important because the political stakes in the question, can men be feminists, have broader implications beyond feminism and most certainly beyond the category of men. Shifting from feminism to the question of solidarity highlights the political dimensions of the question. By drawing attention to the boundaries that delimit the we that poses the question and the they that constitute the other and risks being pinned by the appeal to solidarity. It also demands that we consider the context, the stakes, and the politics that provoke the question to begin with, that make the question possible and utterable, and that create a discursive space in which to produce an answer. Take a moment to grab your smartphone, if you have one. Go ahead, I'll give you a second. Open your favorite social media application whatever it is, Twitter, Instagram, and search for hashtag solidarity. Go ahead, do it. I suspect you'll find a lot of expressions in solidarity with the Ukraine today. The last time I checked on Instagram alone, there were over 1.7 million posts hashtagged with solidarity, including this image post from a piece for Palestine UK, almost 2.2 million hashtagged with Solidaridade in Portuguese, including this image, a post in support of the victims of the recent landslides in the Brazilian city of Petropolis. Over 1.4 with hashtag Solidaridad in Spanish, including this image, a post in support of Donovan Carrillo, the first ever Mexican ice skater to compete in the Winter Olympics. And close to 200,000 hashtag Solidarité in French, including this one, promoting a mutual aid organization in Northeast Paris. Most recently, last week or two weeks ago, when I was doing this, uh, this image promoting a mutual, I'm sorry, this image uh, pro, uh, from the New York State organization Teachers for Choice, 
invited their members to join the convoy to save America in support of the so-called freedom convoy that occupied Ottawa for three weeks. And that, however we make sense of the confluence of interests, demonstrated that no particular political orientation has the market cornered on solidarity. And the term no longer has a limited association with leftist or even progressive viewpoints or ideologies. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, in fact, there has been a veritable explosion of expressions of solidarity. The number of posts on Instagram is in fact five times what it was three years ago when I first uh, checked. Since the beginning of the pandemic two years ago, solidarity has figured quite prominently in the public expressions of everyone from politicians to mutual aid organizers, world leaders, academics, individuals, leading Douglas Broom of the World Economic Forum to suggest that along with COVID-19, we're experiencing in this article that I, that's in the image, they're experiencing a pandemic of solidarity. That's what he called it. You may recall, in fact, that the World Health Organization used the phrase solidarity trial as an example and illustration to call its efforts to bring together global experts to develop a vaccine, initially and more recently to develop treatments for COVID-19. Of course, so-called vaccine nationalism, as well as the profit-driven pharmaceutical industry have utterly undermined the premise of human solidarity that supposedly underpinned the so-called solidarity trial. But I want to suggest that this failure was not a failure of solidarity, but rather the result of competing expressions and understandings of solidarity. At the beginning of the pandemic, solidarity was invoked to acknowledge and describe the many kinds of responses to the crisis, from individual acts and expressions of support to collaboration between governments and international organizations around the world. Sharon Burak, the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, described the lockdowns and the willingness of individuals to confine themselves in order to protect others as, quote, the greatest display of solidarity in human history. In his March 29th, 2020 address, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau pointed to the lighting of the Samuel Champagne Bridge in Montreal as one of the, quote, many signs of solidarity, unquote, to express gratitude and support. And as reminders that, quote, better days are yet to come. This sounds almost quaint two years later and in light of recent events. Given its range of positive connotations, it is not a surprise that solidarity has become so popular, especially in the context of a global pandemic that is affecting the entire planet. It is also not surprising that in such a broad context, the idea of solidarity is mobilized in different ways for different purposes and to accomplish different political aims. As Finnish social thinkers Arlo Latinen and Anna Brigitta Pesci suggest, Many are of the opinion that the concept of solidarity is so ideologically loaded, so flexible, and has such a controversial history that it should be left for ceremonial speeches. And indeed, most of the instances when solidarity has been invoked during the last two years have been largely ceremonial. Political philosopher Sally Schultz might call them parasitical. While all of these instances in some way feed off the various species of solidarity, as Schultz suggests, they mostly seek to, quote, tap into the associated feeling, unquote, without being grounded on a specific commitments or moral obligations. While a range of invocations of solidarity help us to illustrate the problem of defining what solidarity means, they also serve as a way to explore the range of relationships, positions, and commitments that can get articulated under the banner of solidarity. This is not necessarily a bad thing, and we should think carefully about the implications of attempting to police the uses of a term like solidarity. A more useful approach is to ask questions and to engage in a dialogue about the underlying assumptions that support any given use of the concept. Then we can ask ourselves, what do we mean by solidarity? 
Rather than tell you what solidarity is or is not, I want to offer some points of departure for thinking about this question and examining what it means to be in solidarity and what the claim should or should not denote. Perhaps the most obvious aspect of solidarity is that it implies a relationship between two or more people or among members of a group or groups. Solidarity might, reflect, might, might refer to a relationship between members of a group or are, uh, who are bound together by a shared identification. For example, I can be in solidarity with other Puerto Ricans or a shared interest or common cause. For instance, I might be in solidarity with others committed to decolonization, anti-racism and feminism. Similarities in the latter, shared interests in common causes might sometimes involve differences in the former, shared identifications. For, in for instance, in this poster by Alberto Blanco, the Cuban graphic artist expresses solidarity with the Puerto Rican struggle against colonial colonialism and uses Spanish, English, French, and Arabic to invoke world solidarity across differences with Puerto Rico. As a Boricua or Puerto Rican, I can be in solidarity with Palestinians, Mapuches, and indigenous peoples here in Tacaronto who share an experience of colonization and a commitment to decolonization, even though we are different from each other and we have different experiences of colonization. But notice the ease with which I can invoke these labels, Puerto Rican, Mapuche, and even commitments without any regards to the specifics of who I imagine as the object of my solidarity expression. There are more than a million fellow Puerto Ricans like me, for example, or, or not like me, who believe that becoming a state of the United States is the ideal solution to, decolon to colonization. And even some that believe that reuniting with Spain is the right path for Puerto Ricans. But I suspect that these are not the Puerto Ricans that Alberto Blanco imagined. I even like to forget them some of the time. The call to solidarity anticipates its object. It fills the space of otherness in just the same way that the discourse of stranger danger as theorized by Sarah Ahmed anticipates the stranger already known distinguished from other others prior to the encounter. In this anticipation, the call to solidarity inhospitably pins the other in place, hooks her onto the lap of my own comfort and seeks a smile for the camera. This anticipation of the other is also implicit in calls to solidarity with others whose interests might be different or even in competition with our own whether we share an identification or not. This is the call that instigates questions like, can men be feminists? And it is in the anticipation that the question finds its footing. As a cisgendered self-identified man, I benefit from patriarchal structures that grant me privileges. This means that in order for me to be in solidarity with those who identify as women who don't identify with as either men or women or whose gender enactments and identifications are fluid and unpinned from normative gender categories, I must be willing to advance their interests by working against the gender structures that give me privilege. But there is always a but, a condition, a disclaimer. This cartoon by Salvadorian cartoonist Victor Interiano illustrates the point. I'll give you a second to look at just one box. You'll get the gist. What is important to underscore is that the question of how similarities and differences are constituted and imagined, whether around identifications or interest, is always already anticipated in the call to solidarity. For example, understanding how social groups stick together and when and why and how members of a group express loyalty to each other requires assumptions about which identifications and interests matter for defining the boundaries of a group to begin with. In other words, social solidarity depends on the boundaries that 
pin or suture to invoke Stuart Hall, the members of a group in place and that shape the subjective experience of being a member of a group, even though these experiences and what it means to be a group, a member of a group are almost always contested. These questions often become subsumed, if not entirely ignored when it comes to making sense of social solidarity. Because again, it implies and as such demands cohesion at the expense of negotiation. Indeed, the fact that the identification or the label of woman operates across a vast range of differences related to other categories of identification, such as race, sexuality, and gender expression, has been one of the most vexing challenges for feminism, and often at the heart of the question of whether anyone, never mind men, can or would or should ever want to call themselves a feminist. Ask yourself, the last time you claimed to be in solidarity, with whom were you in solidarity? What mental image did you create of them? Did they look like you? How familiar or strange were they? What experiences and assumptions shaped the image you have of those you claim to be in solidarity with? What if there is no one that fits that image? Are you in solidarity at all if that person or group you imagine is, com is a complete or a partial fiction that you've invented? The second aspect that is always implied in the call to solidarity is the intention to fulfill a duty or obligation. Etymologically, this is the oldest meaning of the term, tracing its roots back to the Justinian Codex. In Roman law, an obligatio in solidum, sometimes translated as solidary obligation or obligatio in solido, or in more contemporary legal parlance as joint and several obligation, refers to a shared legal obligation in which each individual debtor is responsible for the entirety of the debt. That is responsible for the obligation in solidum or, so, or solidariously. The call to solidarity echoes the notion of a solidarity obligation, whether that obligation is spiritual, legal, financial, social, moral, ethical, or of whatever kind. The idea of being hooked to a duty or an obligation is always implied in the call to solidarity. The call to solidarity implies the enactment or at least the expression of both an attachment as well as the responsibility that one has for another or that one undertakes on behalf of another. But while the legal statute of a solidary obligation is anchored by a concrete financial or material responsibility in which two or more people consent to share the duty to fulfill a debt, not to each other, but to a specific third individual to whom a debt is owed, the contemporary call to solidarity is usually vague, not just in terms of what precisely is owed, but also to whom and by whom. This shift in the connotations of solidarity as an obligation towards a generalized, quote unquote, human other, away from its specific denotations as a contractual agreement among specific individuals, occurred during the so-called enlightenment opening up the signifying registers of solidarity towards a broad ideological framework. The connotations of the word solidarity that circulate today, related as they are to notions of human relationality and social responsibility, emerged in the late 18th century, evolving and flourishing through the 19th century, most significantly in France. Here's an image of the Dictionnaire de la langue française first appearance of the word solidarity in 1649, I think. The shift from a legal construct to a philosophical one yielded an idealist rather than a concrete conception of solidarity expressed in the third leg of the French Revolution's triumvirate, liberté, égalité, fraternité. These were the clarion calls of the French Revolution, 
when the serfs and the sanculos of France joined the emerging maritime bourgeoisie to rise against the monarchy at the end of the 18th century to defeat the old regime. It is in this context that solidarity as fraternity emerges as a universalizing concept like liberty and equality, but one that sought to characterize not the rights, but a duty and to prescribe the attachments and feelings that the free citizens of the French nation had or ought to have with their fellow citizens. It evolved as a way to resolve the tension between individual freedom and the proclaimed egalitarianism of liberal humanism. In other words, as a modern liberal idea, solidarity sets out to prescribe a kind of intimacy, to borrow on the work of Lisa Lowe, not just in terms of how individuals ought to behave towards like others, but how they were supposed to feel and the kinds of duties that structured the affective dispositions of individuals as members of a group, whether defined narrowly, members of a family or a community, or broadly, citizens of the nation or members of the, of the presumed human race. Following Lisa Lowe's work, this intimacy of solidarity was of course linked to other global intimacies that link slavery, servitude, and colonialism to emerging conceptions of the human, and of course, to the very idea of solidarity. Today, I don't have the space to elaborate this point, so you will have to wait until the book comes out, but I want to, uh, and, and instead I want to examine how the evolution of the concept of solidarity is enmeshed with anti-Black racism and projects of colonial expansion. That's what I do in the book, so you'll have to wait for that. Here, what I want to focus on is the idea that the call to solidarity is a call that demands not just a disposition or an intimacy, but an act. The most common way in which solidarity claims are expressed in English, we stand in solidarity, is the best illustration of this aspect of solidarity. Notwithstanding the ableist language that to be in solidarity, you must somehow be able to stand. What I want to point to is the idea that the call to solidarity compels an action that denotes a shift in condition, a move to stand. While in Romans languages like French and Spanish, the verb, the verb form of solidarity is quite common, solidarizar, me solidarizo. In English, the expression requires an active and reflexive verb, to stand. In short, we cannot think of the call to solidarity without an action through which to respond to this call and to express our intentions towards others. And sometimes that requires lying down rather than standing. These are images of people lying down in solidarity. Today, solidarity intentions are rooted in abstract moral and ethical ideas about what it means to be a good political agent and about the proper way to relate to others whom we want to support, whether based on similarity or difference. As such, the call to solidarity involves the enactment of a particular kind of subject or moral self. And we should pause to ask who precisely is positioned to enact the call to solidarity? Whose hand gives and whose hands receive? It is crucial that we ask how enactments of solidarity are often expressions of how the one who acts on behalf of others is complicit in the conditions that make solidarity possible or even desirable. Particularly in this age of social media, this is an image of representing social media, enacting solidarity plays a significant symbolic role and we should ponder its value in the affective registers of those who enjoy different kinds of positional privilege, like men. To be in solidarity is to claim a higher moral ground, yet who gets to claim this moral ground? Whose ego is saved by this work? As the kind of performance, solidarity can be interpreted as, as an expression of what Paulo Freire called malefic or false generosity. Or in fact, as an act in the words of Shireen Razak of stealing the pain of others. As such, expressions of solidarity are, are often ironic expressions of what I have called elsewhere deferred complicity. 
or the, the complicity of those who enact or invoke solidarity in the injustices that produce the need for solidarity in the first place. This deferred complicity is akin to the ways in which colonization was integral to the evolution of the concept of solidarity itself, and therefore a contemporary expression of the coloniality of solidarity. While again, I don't have the time now to illustrate this argument, what I want to point out is that at the level of the subject of the individual, when privileged or advantaged individuals express a commitment and take action on behalf of disadvantaged others, we should ask how the experiences of oppression or marginalization are linked to the former's privileged positions. In short, certain forms or approaches to solidarity are invested in the continuation of dominant relations. And we ought to examine what such solidarity claims reveal about the problem of privilege and the limits of generosity, empathy, and alliance. Examining how claims to solidarity are themselves premised on particular social conditions illustrates the complicity of those who invoke solidarity as a political project, pointing to the limits of possibility of solidarity itself. These limits of, these limits of possibility, in fact, these limits of possibility are in fact the expression of the sediments of colonialism and slavery that made the very idea of solidarity possible in the first place. We could and we should, of course, also point to practices of solidarity such as mutual aid that are not premised on inequality and that begin to point to the possibility of a solidarity that is perhaps truly transformative. But for that transformation to occur, the enactment of solidarity should not seek to confirm or much less to elevate the moral character of the one who is in solidarity. Doing so pins the solidarity actor in place and hooks the other in order to make solidarity possible. Thinking about solidarity otherwise requires that we remain vigilant to such enactments and ask not only what is the intention, but also to whom is this intention directed? What is the source of the intention? On the basis of what commitments does the intention emerge? And by extension, who is outside the parameters of the intention? In other words, in thinking about the uses of the concept of solidarity, we can ask, who is the we? Who is the they? And what is the problem? Moreover, we can ask how this problem is to be addressed, by who, to what end, and what are, and, and what are we willing to do, and perhaps even to sacrifice in the process. And most importantly, did they consent to us acting on their behalf? These questions are helpful as we reflect on and articulate the values as well as the ethical and political commitments that lead any of us, regardless of our political commitments, to respond to the call of solidarity and to decide whether solidarity can serve us in the face of social challenges. When we use the term, it is essential that we surface the underlying assumptions and conditions that inform such claims. Otherwise, solidarity risks becoming a hook that pins our interests as well as our moral commitments on a self-righteous platform that fails to come even close to answering the call to solidarity. Instead of solidarity as a grasping, as a pinning of both the we and the they in place, what if we responded to the call of solidarity by ungrasping, by moving away and opening toward another mode of being? As a, possible, as a possible response to such a call, I want to propose a pedagogy of creative solidarity. Creative solidarity is not a standing with, but a moving with, even if you're sitting. It is an act an action and a verb that is both reflexive and transitive. That is, the action is directed toward both the self and the other. As such, creative solidarity is not a holding in place, but a letting go, not a grasping, but an ungrasping. Creative solidarity is not a righteous position, but a humble one, a vulnerable one. It manifests through imperfection, a vulnerability to be exposed and to be wrong or also to be remade anew, to become. 
Creative solidarity begins in the improbability of getting it right, the vulnerability of being otherwise than we are. Creative solidarity is not a knowing, but an unfolding, an inquiry, a recovery. It begins not from the assertion, I know who we are, but from the question, who are we becoming? And the puzzle, who are we to become? Can we be solidarious with each other? These are profoundly pedagogical propositions. Pedagogical because creative solidarity is an intentional, consensual, and reciprocal being with another, and a being that transforms the we, the you and me, the us and them, the totality of relationality. Solidarity is a relationship. It begins from the premise of a you and I, an us and them, and as such involves boundaries, setting them, as well as negotiating and challenging the space between us. And as such should be a process of consensual engagement, where the boundaries of action are shaped by the possibility of harm. Therefore, solidarity is not a state of being, much less a standing hooked in place. It is a moving and a becoming. To speak of a pedagogy of creative solidarity is to note that the call to solidarity is always articulated in relationship to the desire for a particular shift or transformation on the social conditions that shape experience. Where the transformation is going, who is transformed, or the extent of transformation at hand is not always defined. But there is no sense in which the word solidarity is used that does not imply a desired change and thus an ethic. It should be obvious that solidarity and pedagogy share in common that they are both always premised on relationality. That is neither pedagogy nor solidarity can be done alone. They occur always in relationship. Therefore, solidarity always implies that we have some sort of shared responsibility to others near or far, and that we share an affinity either in terms of a collective identification, shared need or desire, or a shared commitment to a cause or a struggle. To say that creative solidarity is pedagogical is to observe that it requires intentional actions that are directed toward producing a change in the conditions that shape experience. No one is in solidarity by accident or comes into solidarity relations without some desire, intention, or commitment. As pedagogical work, solidarity should always involve a praxis in the Freirean sense of movement between reflection and action. In that sense, solidarity is transitive since, this, since the action always requires subjects who act with and who influence and are influenced by other subjects. We are solidarious with each other. Like pedagogy, solidarity action is also always situated within a space that is shaped by the contours of existing material conditions and dominant symbolic frames, which can also be the object of transformation through a pedagogy of solidarity. It is precisely this move towards solidarity as transformation that brings us to solidarity as a creative or more specifically, a productive endeavor. Creative solidarity is creative because it produces new conditions. It creates new terms of engagement, new modes of relating, new intentions. Creative solidarity is solidarity in a constant flux of invention and reinvention. It is a persistently dissatisfied solidarity, one that is always imagining things differently, maybe even a little bit better. The answer to the call of solidarity usually involves a hooking in place, if not of the one who asks, usually the one that does the hooking, often of the other that is the object of the solidarity expression. My mother meant well, and I've gone back to the image of my mother here, my mother meant well when she hooked me onto her lap, of course, keeping me from stumbling onto the grass, or as she insists she was doing today, getting me to smile for the camera. If not me, at least the camera could hook that moment of joy, of childhood innocence and motherly love in place. Hooking my infant body onto her lap or to hook my smile to the photograph expressed my mother's attachment to the infant she birthed and to her identity as a mother, 
One that, as a, one that as a 22 year old university student, she was ambivalent about, I suspect. Yet in the moment captured in this photograph, we were one linked through, with, linked through birth with my body once again cocooned in her belly, hooked in place, undifferentiated. In turn, my 11 year old question, can men be feminist, was also an attempt to hook my mother in place. If I can be a feminist, you will always love me. Asking my mother whether men could be feminist was an expression of the budding realization that our gender differences were not simply physical differences, but that they had political meaning and consequence. Listening to my mother and compañeras talk about los hombres implicated me, even as an 11 year old boy, and created a rupture in the certainty that my mother would always love me. Narrowing the growing gap between my mother and I required a gesture, maybe one that would even make her smile. Can men be feminists? The question risked a consumption, a manner of digesting the difference that constitutes the other, a way to eat the mother so that the child no longer has to fear being unloved. No. At that moment, my mother became ungraspable to me, no longer available for the intimacy that defined us as mother and son up to that moment. It was terrifying. And yet the terror is necessary if we are to move beyond expressions of solidarity that are not simply about hooking the subject in place and that instead make the other and ourselves ungraspable beyond the positional structuring that hooks all of us in place. After all, the one that hooks, the we with the privileges that make the question of solidarity utterable must also stay in place, hooked onto the social positioning that allows us to hook the other, even especially in the name of solidarity. Recently, my mother and I revisited the question of men and feminism and talked about this picture. She laughed when I said I thought she was hooking me in place and told me that she was really just trying to make me laugh. The moment that picture was taken was not a moment of solidarity, regardless of how you define it. But the way this picture, this picture has figured materially in my life and the way my mother and I have come to make sense of it is in fact about solidarity, about the possibility that my mother and I can release each other in order to always love each other, in order to be solidarios with each other. As a grown man starting my sixth decade, I still sometimes try to hook my mother by debating the question of men and feminism. I know that I don't have to be a feminist for my mother to love me, and she doesn't have to use her finger to make me smile. Our relationship is premised on the inalterability of the fact that we are made through each other and that are linked to each other as mother and son, but also as man and woman is unbreakable. Yet as beings in the world, we are also ungraspable to each other and thus, we are always coming to know each anew. The space between us expands, even as our intimacy contracts, precisely because we see each other as autonomous and ungraspable, yet always in relationship. When we pose the question of solidarity, it is precisely the ungraspable distance between us that makes the question possible and potentially answerable. My mother has demonstrated this to me in the way her answer to the question of feminism has shifted over the last four decades, as she has come into solidarity with other women, women unlike herself, queer women, trans women, white women, and other women of color in the global south whose racialization and colonial experience differs from hers. It is through this movement between difference and similarity that my mother and I have learned to live in the space between the we and the they. And it is that space that has led her to change her mind about feminism. It is why when my own son asks his abuela if men can be feminists, the answer is an unquestionable and enthusiastic yes. Thank you so much. I was having some trouble getting off of um, uh, mute. And I think it's because no one wants to hear from me and would rather just continue to hear from you. It was um extremely engaging uh conversation and I, I thank you very much for sharing your thoughts um wrapped in a very personal uh story um from beginning to end um i i have much to reflect upon on your in in what you've talked today so thank you very much um for coming and being our keynote um Welcome presenter we had a, a number of um, questions uh, that we uh, wanted to use as, as points of reflection for, 
for those who came today to, to think about, um, to reflect upon when you're thinking about solidarity, we've posted them in the chat, but we will also use them as part of um, our uh, Twitter, Twitter feed and put that out there. So if you want to engage further in the thinking and further in, in, in this understanding, um, I encourage you to have a look at the chat, copy them down if you like, uh, copy and paste them down, or look to our, our Twitter feed so that you can, um, you can certainly uh, continue on your own thinking. And we look forward to your book when that comes out at, at, at some point. I'm sure you look forward to the book coming out as well, probably more than even us. Um, on that note, then, we are at time. Uh, again, I thank everyone for coming today and being, uh, being part of Inclusion Week and part of this, spe this specific talk. Um, I wish everyone a great day. And I, um, and I look forward to those who will be able to join us tomorrow for our um, second panel and our final workshop on allyship. And with that note, I will say goodbye and thank you to all. Thank you.